So in part one, we talked about how there is almost certainly a time-traveling Bran lurking in our story who potentially is causing all sorts of trouble. He perhaps visited Jon, but it's difficult to say how large his influence is. And also in part one, we talked about the nature of time travel in fiction, how it's filled with paradoxes. Though consciousness time travel is our author's go-to method for getting around these paradoxes. And so let's explore consciousness time travel and look at our author's previous works. So I'd like to go over three time travel stories that George R. R. Martin wrote prior to A Song of Ice and Fire. Chronologically, the first is For a Single Yesterday, published in 1975. For a Single Yesterday takes its name from the lyrics of Me and Bobby McGee, a song written by Chris Christopherson and made famous by Janis Joplin. These are two of George R. R. Martin's favorite musicians. The more complete lyric from which the title takes its name is, Well, I would trade all my tomorrows for one single yesterday. And the story is thematically about how society clings to culture and tradition instead of going forward with progress, just as humans on an individual level cling to the past as a better time instead of moving on with their lives. The story compares this beautiful but harmful nostalgia to a heavy drug. And we should remember that Janis Joplin herself died of a heroin overdose. So the story takes place in a post-apocalyptic world where a small band of survivors is trying to start society again after a nuclear war. Although he is not the narrator, a character named Keith is the real focus of the story. Keith is a man obsessed with the better days before the blast, those with his girlfriend, and he's also a great musician, being called the culture of the commune and playing music at night for everyone. Notably, he finishes every evening by playing Me and Bobby McGee, which the entire commune sings along to. Now, Keith also has a limited supply of a drug called cronine, which allows you to go into one's memories and re-experience them as a lifelike hallucination. And Keith uses cronine to go back and visit his dead girlfriend. Keith is essentially framed as a drug addict, with his memories being his heroine. The conflict of the story arises when a new commune leader comes in and wants Keith's cronine. The new leader hopes that useful knowledge can be extracted from exploring memories. For example, someone died of an appendicitis, and they lament not being able to do a surgery properly. Perhaps they could go back and observe proper surgery techniques. Now, there is an interesting rub to cronine. While nearly everyone thinks it's just a memory-searching drug, Keith is convinced it's stronger. He thinks that real time travel is taking place, though no one else buys it. Anyway, there's a vote and the cronine is taken from Keith so that others can use it for research. And so later on, Keith steals the cronine back and takes a dose along with a bottle of sleeping pills. Keith was convinced that this was a way to ensure that he would stay in the past. Anyway, after Keith dies, the cronine doesn't prove to be very useful, but the commune actually starts doing better anyway. It grows into a town, gets electricity, has ample food, and then the story ends on a rather ambiguous note. The narrator asks the new guitar player to play Me and Bobby McGee, and no one knows the words. The odd ending makes the reader wonder if the commune simply moved on and forgot the song, or if Keith somehow changed the timeline. Now, despite the story being written in 1975, the similarities to Ice and Fire are rather strong. This passage in particular is relevant. That's all you've got now, I said. I closed the box with a snap and handed it to him. Cronin isn't a time machine, Keith. Just a hallucinogen that happens to work on memory. He laughed. They used to debate that way back when. The experts all said Cronin was a memory drug, but they never took Cronin. Neither of you, Gary, but I know. I've time-tripped. It's not memory. It's more. You go back, Gary. You really do. You live it again. Whatever it was. You can't change anything, but you know it's real all the same. So in both stories, we have characters entering memories. Bran with the Weirwood and Keith with his own mind. Going back to better times. Keith to his girlfriend, Bran to Winterfell. And we have a conflation of memory with the actual past. This is how Bloodraven describes past, present, and future. Men live their lives trapped in an eternal present between the mists of memory and the sea of shadow. That is all we know of the days to come. Also, we should keep in mind that Keith's memory and the Weirwoods are both described as the culture of society. And in both stories, characters are given psychotropic drugs to assist with their trips, which they find nostalgically intoxicating. 
If you recall, Bran thinks Werewood Paste tastes like a kiss from his mother. Also in both stories, there is an effort to use time trips to learn from the past, Blood Riven specifically says that the past is only to learn from, and the commune leader wants Keith's cronine for the same reason. And there is a question of whether one can truly affect the past. Keith and Blood Raven say no, but we see things to the contrary. Now, George R. R. Martin loves ambiguous haunting endings, and we don't actually know if Keith made it back in time, or even if he did, we aren't sure if he can truly affect the past. That said, the fact that no one knows me and Bobby McGee is astoundingly weird. Everyone in the commune sang the song every night for four years. And even though the ending of the story is years later and the old commune group is now in the minority of the town, it's hard to believe that no one would know the words to the song. And so we have to wonder if Keith actually made it to the past and found his girlfriend and went somewhere else. And if he did, perhaps the timeline changed. It overrode itself and Keith was never part of the commune and never sang those songs. I mean, metaphorically, that is what happened. Keith removed himself from the commune and it moved on and forgot him. They no longer sing Me and Bobby McGee. That is, they no longer sing about how the past is better than the future. His songs and his message are thoroughly gone in the town, and so it was like he was never there. There is just the question of whether he literally was never there. Now, the second time travel story I'd like to talk about is Under Siege. It was written and published last, in 1985, but it's best to talk about next as it shares many similarities to For a Single Yesterday. Under Siege takes its name from the Siege of Sveaborg, a siege that took place during the Finnish War of 1808 to 1809 between Sweden and Russia. But Under Siege also has a second meaning as it refers to an ongoing nuclear and bio-attack siege on a bunker in a future world war, and there's a third meaning as Under Siege refers to taking a mind by another mind telepathically. So the story takes place in both the future, an apocalyptic world, and in the past, during the Siege of Sveaborg. In the future, we follow a small band of survivors in a bunker who have essentially given up on their present. They are in the middle of a nuclear and bioweapon war between the US and the Soviet Union and want to go back in time and change history to erase what has happened and replace it with a new timeline. And so to do so, they have half a dozen genetically altered time-traveling telepaths, one of whom is essentially Tyrion. I mean, he doesn't actually have a name, but he's so clearly who Tyrion was based on. He's a highly educated, snarky, drunkard, chess-playing, noseless dwarf who is very down on his love life. Anyway, Tyrion is the last survivor of these time travelers and has the ability to send his consciousness back in time into another human body to alter that human's choices. He can essentially do what Bran did to Hodor, and what Bran did to Hodor, that is, take over someone's body and do it through time, except without frying anyone's brain. Now, the previous time travelers each tried to affect some point in Russian history to prevent the USSR from coming into being, but they all failed to significantly alter history, and each of them died. And so Tyrion is considered the last hope and is sent back to the Siege of Sveaborg. So the Siege of Sveaborg is considered by some a decisive surrender made by just a few people that lost the entire Finnish war. Though this is likely bunk as historical events are usually very complicated and depend on hundreds of factors. But nonetheless, in this story, it is presented as a situation where a single decision can have huge effects. A surrender means the Russians win, prosper, become the Soviet Union, and there's a nuclear war. No surrender means that perhaps Sweden wins and Russia doesn't become the Soviet Union, and there's no nuclear war. Anyway, Tyrion keeps going back in time and tries to take over the mind of a man named Antonin and influence his decisions. The hope is to get Antonin to convince others around him not to surrender. Those around Antonin, though, appear stubborn, and so Tyrion's commander decides that Antonin will be used as an assassin instead. Tyrion is uncomfortable with this decision as Antonin will die and will be remembered forever as a dishonorable traitor. Anyway, the moment of the potential surrender or non-surrender approaches in the past, and so the people of the future decide to have one last night of debauchery before they send Tyrion back for the final mission. They are hoping, after all, that they're going to be blinked out of existence. Tyrion, though, is not allowed to party as he's too important. 
He does walk around though and sees a gangbang and a brutal fight and the woman he likes having sex with the commander of the operation. No one cares about him though. The woman that he likes doesn't even stop by to say goodbye. And so on the final mission, Tyrion prepares to seize Antonin's mind, but then something different happens. The two minds don't fight for control of the body, but instead decide to blend and coexist in friendship. Additionally, it's revealed that Tyrion, just like Keith, took sleeping pills to kill himself to ensure that his consciousness stayed in the past. Anyway, the new Tyrion Antonin hybrid assassinates no one and decides to leave Sviaborg, allowing the Russians to take the fortress as history normally unfolds. However, Tyrion Antonin then moves to America and begins to alter history there, causing John Charles Fremont to defeat James Buchanan in the election of 1856, the implication being that if changes to Russian history are not possible or ineffectual to stopping war, perhaps changes to American history can stop it. Now, again with Under Siege, we see some big similarities to Ice and Fire all over the story. Tyrion and other Time Riders actually time travel in a tank of tubes that's reminiscent of the tangled roots around Bloodraven, and like Bloodraven and Bran, the Time Riders are genetically special, allowing for their telepathic abilities. It's also worth noting that Tyrion refers to embodying other people in this story as a second life. The very term Varimir Six Skins used to describe mentally blending with another being after one's death. And let's keep in mind that Tyrion and Varimir essentially have the same fate. After they die, their consciousness blends with another mind in a second life. And the story of Under Siege is also heavily compared to chess, just as Ice and Fire is described as a Game of Thrones or a Game of Sivas. Now, it's rather significant that in real life, George R. R. Martin was a big chess guy and even organized chess tournaments professionally for a period of time. And in this story, Tyrion is a chess player and the characters describe their time travel missions as a game of chess. Let's remember that when playing chess, at least when playing it well, a player imagines unfolding possible outcomes. The player goes forward and backwards in time many times when considering moves. Now it's worth noting that time travel in Under Siege appears to work in a somewhat similar fashion to For a Single Yesterday. That is, if someone sends their consciousness back in time to change things, the timeline is overwritten. Though admittedly, like with For a Single Yesterday, the characters are not very certain. This is how time travel is described in Under Siege. Your success may doom us all. When you change the past, the present as it now exists may simply cease to exist, and us with it. But our nation will live, and millions we have lost will be restored to us, healthier, Happier versions of ourselves will enjoy the rich lives that were denied us. You yourself will be born whole, without sickness or deformity. Or talent, I say, in which I won't be able to go back and do this, in which case, the past stays unchanged. The paradox does not apply. You have been briefed on this. The past and the present and future are not contemporaneous, and it will be Antonin who affects the change, not yourself. He is of that time. So we get a relatively detailed description of time travel, and that last little bit is significant. Tyrion specifically brings up the grandfather paradox as a potential problem. If he goes back and changes the timeline, how can he go back and change the timeline? And his commander tells him the solution. With consciousness time travel, cause can be attributed to the host. The paradox dissipates within the complexity of free will. In this case, Antonin's free will. Tyrion can disappear, and Antonin can still metaphorically kill the grandfather. Now, I will say the first part of the commander's explanation of time is more perplexing. The commander claims that the past, present, and future are not contemporaneous. On the face of it, this is obvious. By definition, the past, present, and future aren't occurring at the same time. But what I believe the commander is actually saying is that there is no set timeline that we can observe from outside of time. Looking at past, present, and future all at once and examining human causation and paradox isn't the way to go. Instead, characters exist in one moment of time at a time, unchained to the actions of their future selves. It doesn't really make sense, but I don't think it matters too much as consciousness time travel is already a solution to the grandfather paradox by itself. Now, the final story that we need to discuss is Unsound Variations, published in 1982. 
Unsound Variations is a story of regret and revenge. It involves a bunch of men who used to be on the Northwestern chess team together and who all had pretty crappy lives. Northwestern, by the way, is George R. Martin's alma mater. The crew gets called back together by the antagonist team member Bruce Bunnish, who supposedly screwed up a big game back in the day with a botched move, leading to their team losing a potentially grand upset against the University of Chicago, which, by the way, is my alma mater. So the old teammates come to Bunnish's house, which turns out to be a mansion, and find out that he's filthy rich. Bunnish meets the crew, who wonder why they've all been called together, and Bunnish reveals that actually he never botched that move back in the day. The game was already lost, and it was an unsound variation. There was no winning result possible. Being labeled as a screw-up choker by the crew had angered him, and so he went and invented a time machine to enact revenge on everyone. Bunnish reveals that his time machine kills his present body, but then sends his consciousness with all of his memories back to an earlier point in his life. He can relive his life and make different choices as a wiser individual. His machine is just like Groundhog's Day, but he can go to any point in his life. And every time he does so, he goes through an alternate timeline. Of course, within the context of the story, it's like undoing chess moves and trying again, the ultimate regret undoer. Bunnish has lived multiple lives, going back, using his knowledge of the future to get rich, but also stalking his team members, stealing their ideas, and sabotaging their careers and lives. At the end of the story, Bunnish offers the protagonist his machine to go back in time and try again, but the protagonist refuses, accepting that his life is pretty good and not wanting to leave his girlfriend with a dead body. The men also all realize that Bunnish can change the past, but his changes just take him to a new timeline. Their timeline, the one they live in now, is not touchable by Bunnish. Yes, Bunnish can hurt alternate versions of them, but not them. The men all decide to leave Bunnish's house, and then Bunnish goes and uses his machine to send his consciousness back in time again, killing his body in the story's timeline. The protagonist feels sorry for Bunnish, and declares that Bunnish is in an unsound variation. There is no combination of moves that will lead to a win. Now, first and foremost, it's important to note that in Unsound Variations, our author uses the same metaphor to describe time as an ice and fire, and then trashes that metaphor. This is how Bunnish describes time in Unsound Variations. Time is said to be the fourth dimension, but it differs from the other three in one conspicuous way. Our consciousness moves along it. From past to present only, alas. Time itself does not flow, no more than, say, width can flow. Our minds flicker from one instant of time to the next. This analogy was my starting point. I reasoned that if consciousness can move in one direction, it can move in the other direction as well. So Bunnish tells us specifically that humans normally move forward in time, but flowing like a river is a bad analogy. Time is not pushing anyone, human consciousness flickers, and moves on its own. And because it does not flow with the movement of time, it means consciousness can actually go backwards. And this is Bloodraven's description of time in Brand 3. For men, time is a river. We are trapped in its flow, hurtling from past to present, always in the same direction. But of course, we know Bloodraven is wrong. Time travel is possible. The river analogy is just as wrong in Ice and Fire as it is in Unsound Variations. And if you remember, Bloodraven was also wrong when claiming that men are trapped between memory and the unknown future. Men are not trapped, and Bran has shown this. And Keith from For a Single Yesterday tells us that these time experiences are more than memory. Bloodraven just has the worst metaphors. Now, in addition to the description of time, Unsound Variations is similar to Ice and Fire with the chess analogy as Under Siege was, but it's the thematic feel of Unsound Variations that makes it feel like Ice and Fire. The story is about regret, revenge, and wondering about roads not taken, something that nearly every Ice and Fire character is obsessed with. Additionally, Bunnish is the ultimate puppet master, controlling all of the characters in the story like chess pieces. He's been watching all of the characters for countless years and has been controlling their paths, much like Bloodraven or Quaith or Marwyn. And while Under Siege is about individual moves making a difference in a game of chess, Unsound Variations is about being the grand master chess player, knowing all and controlling all. 
something that we imagine a time-traveling brand to be. Now, when comparing these three stories, we see some similarities and differences. The method of time travel in all three stories is consciousness time travel, avoiding the grandfather paradox in the process. But what is quite notable is that suicide is used in all three stories to keep consciousness in the past and from returning to the present. What exactly does this mean for a time-traveling Bran? Now, the mechanism of time travel does differ in each story. It's a narcotic in For a Single Yesterday, technology and genetics in Under Siege, and technology alone in Unsound Variations. And narcotics and genetics certainly play a role with Bran, though he seems to use nature, the werewood, instead of technology for his time travel. And the nature of time itself seems to be a single changeable timeline in two stories, For a Single Yesterday and Under Siege, but it's multiple timelines and unsound variations. The show Game of Thrones showed a causal loop. What will be the nature of time in Ice and Fire, and will that be significant? Well, we will go deeper into comparing our three previous time stories and what they mean for Bran in part three. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time.